If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 7? And I'm also going to read a portion of scripture before I jump into my testimony. Luke chapter 7, we're going to start at the very end, verse 36, and read to the end of the chapter. And before we go into the Word of God, would you join me in prayer one more time? Father, I thank you for your Word. That through it, you reveal to us truth. And you tell us that the truth sets us free. God, I pray this morning that you would do a mighty work in this church and set people free. I pray, God, that you would speak to the dry bones. God, and create life. God, as author said, there's nothing that we can do to climb the mountain. There's nothing that we can do to reach you. You are so holy and so far above us that you have to come down to us and there's nothing that we can do to resurrect our dead spirits. You have to speak life to us. And God, I pray this morning you would speak life to these people. That you would call dead men to be alive. That even as happened in her church so many years ago, there would be some sitting here this morning that have been dead in the pews of a church for years that need to be resurrected. That you would do that miracle this morning. Father, we believe you for it. We thank you for it. God, I pray for a miracle in me this morning, that you would give me a focus, that you would give me the ability to laser in on what you would have us to say. And God, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Join me in verse 36, reading down to the end of the chapter. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house to recline at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them, with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Then he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. For a long time, I did not like these verses of Scripture. I don't know if you're honest, honest enough to say to yourself, there's parts of the Bible that you don't like. But if we have a book from a holy God who is perfect and higher than us, and you don't come across parts of the Bible you don't like, you may need to start reading a little bit harder. Because he challenges us, and he changes us, 
And this is one of those parts of the Bible, every time I read it, I just don't like this. It just makes me not feel good. And it took me years after I became a Christian to really understand these verses. And after I tell you my story, I'll come back to this and explain how I came to like this part of the Bible. Maybe there's others now that I don't like so much. But for now, this one, I, I tend to like this part of the Bible. You probably were here last week for my wife's testimony. And she was on one end of the spectrum of testimonies, and I'm on the complete other opposite end. This is Church Kids Sunday, obviously. I was raised going to church. I was raised in what I would call a Christian home. You know, sometimes you, you say that and people get different ideas of what a Christian home is and some think it's this and some think it's that. To me, I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised believing that Jesus was the Son of God. I was raised praying before meals. I was raised believing the Bible was the Word of God. I was raised going to church. I can remember at a young age having an interest in the things of God. I can remember uh, in our house we had this thick book of Bible stories. And I can't remember if it was late elementary school or whatever, but I remember carrying that huge book of Bible stories to school because I was just so interested. I wanted, to, I wanted to read through it and devour it up and take up everything I could. We were active in church. Uh, my mom would teach Sunday school and help with BBS, and we did Christmas plays and all sorts of different things. And it's what I knew. Church was what I knew. Just like Roger, uh, I grew up wanting to please people and please my parents, especially being an only child. I was the only one. They say that, you know, you're so perfect, you don't have another one. Well, that's not exactly true, but I was the only one. And being that only child, I wanted to please my parents and please my mom and dad, and it hurt me deeply when I felt like I let them down. So I was always the good kid. And so I was raised going to church, and there came a point in my preteen years, older child years, where I got tired of going to church. I just, just didn't interest me anymore. Just didn't want to go. And I realized that if I stayed in bed until I heard mom get in the car and drive away, I didn't have to go to church. So I would start sleeping in until she was gone, which killed me. I don't know if you remember as a kid being forced to take naps and just Oh, I hated it, but it just, I just hated staying in bed. I just wanted to get up, but I knew it was either stay in this bed or go to church. I didn't want to go to church, so I stayed in bed. Now, I don't remember how much time went by, but eventually my mom at that church began to think, there's got to be more to God than what I'm experiencing here. There's got to be more to this relationship with Christ than just what we're going through the motions doing week in and week out. So eventually, she found another church and started going to it. By then, I was uh, probably in a preteen. And she started doing what many parents do, forced me to go to church. I don't remember being forced to go Sunday mornings. Maybe I was. But there was this youth gathering. And she made me go to this youth gathering. And I hated going to the youth gathering. Because aside from being an only child, I'm also an introvert. I don't like being around people I don't know. This is much more comfortable for me. Standing here talking to you as a group is much more comfortable for me than meeting one of you I don't know afterwards and trying to hold a conversation. You'll, you'll hear a lot of awkward questions. Talk about the weather. Talk about where you live. I don't know. We'll figure something out. But I was an introvert and being forced to hang out with a group of teenagers that I didn't know all by myself was not very comfortable. But it was at this time God began to do a work in my life. And honestly, it's not very clear to me what happened then. We all have points in our lives that we remember very clearly. We all have points in our lives of things that we are never going to forget. I can remember pretty much most of my wedding day. I can remember the date I was married to the happiness of my wife. I can remember on 9-11, it 
exactly where I was and what was happening. I can remember that I was uh, I was on staff as a pastor, a pastor at that time, full time in the church. We had Mondays and Tuesdays off. I remember 9-11 was a Tuesday because it was my second day off. I had a habit of, of every morning before I went to work, I would drive through Dunkin' Donuts, get two donuts and a coffee, which is why I had to lose so much weight a few years ago. I did that for years. And I would do that every morning on my way to work. But this one particular day, on Tuesday, it was my day off, I decided I was going to do that anyways, which was out of my routine. And I, I did that, and I, uh, on the way home on the radio, I heard about these planes hitting the Twin Towers. And I went inside and spent the whole day watching the news, as many of us did. I lived in upstate New York at the time. I remember the panic that hit me when I realized one of my friends was in the air that day on his way to piece of training. I flew out of one of those airports. I can remember so much about that day because it was vivid. But when I came to Christ, I can't remember any of it. I can't tell you the day. I can't tell you the, 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 the altar call. I, can't, I don't feel that, I don't remember that tug, that feel that Anya talks about. It's all just kind of a blur. I've got a friend who became my best friend in high school. For four years, we were in it together, thick and thin through everything. And he tells me, and as I talk to him, the things that I tell him, he said, oh yeah, we must have been saved the same day. I got saved on such and such a day in this altar call, and even though we didn't know each other, you must have been there, you must have got saved at the same time. But I don't remember it. I don't remember meeting my best friend. I remember at one point, he was not in my life. The next thing I remember, he was in my life, and we knew each other. I don't remember getting to know him. And I think sometimes, some of us who have been Christians for a long time, may struggle with that. You've been told you have to know the day you were saved. You were told it's important to know the day you were converted. And I have to tell you, I don't think it is. The same way with my, my, my best friend, it's not important that I know the day I got to know him. It's not important that I say, oh, I remember I, I met you on, it was June the 5th, and we hung out for a while and shook hands, and we began a relationship. What's important was that he was not in my life, and then he was. And what's important about Jesus is that you know he was not in your life, and now he is. And if you ever had doubts about that, if you ever had doubts about he is in your life now, that's when you start asking questions. You may not be able to pinpoint the day, or the hour, or the year, but is Jesus in your life now? That's what's important. So at some point in my life, I became a Christian. It was in middle school. And I remember my last year in middle school, it was a, a turning point, as probably as most of our lives in that adolescent age. I wanted to be one of the cool kids. It's hard to imagine looking at me now that I wasn't, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I had, and it's funny that I have a cousin that's here today. And I, the way I viewed her, she was one of the cool kids. And she was in that group. And I knew if I could ride her coattails, I could, get, I could slide right to that cool kid's club and be where I wanted to be. But somehow, before that happened, Jesus got a hold of me. And I remember that last year of middle school, when I think it was around Easter time, I had gotten a cross for Easter. And even though a cross is very nebulous in our day and age, everyone wears crosses. To me, it represents something. So I would take that cross, and I would put it inside of my shirt and wear it to school. Because I didn't want anyone to know I was a Christian. Even though I bet you 80 to 90% of the kids in that school would identify as Christian, to me it meant something. To me it was real. And I don't want to be made fun of for my belief in Jesus Christ. So I took my light and I hid it that last year at middle school. I remember after that, it was between uh, last year of middle school and the first year of high school, I knew that if I was going to be a Christian, if I was going to really live out this life, that I had to make a stand for Jesus. There's, there's no way to be a Christian and to let your light not be shining. You can't hide your light and be a Christian. It's an oxymoron. You have to let it shine. And I had to decide for myself whether I was going to let my light shine, let people know that I was a Christian, 
not just claim the name Christian because I go to church, but that I really was a born again follower of Jesus Christ, or whether I was going to hide for the next four years in high school. And I remember uh, going clothes shopping with my mom for clothes from school. And I don't know if you remember the Christian t shirts that were out in the 90s. They were pretty much in your face. We have a lot of these now that have faith written in cursive and joy, and they're very nice. And uh, they had one back then that, that was like Lord's Gym and had Jesus uh, benching uh, a cross and blood everywhere. And uh, I had one that said Messiah. And I, was, I was looking for it to bring it in because I still have a sweater. And it had a, a picture of Jesus and, and crown of thorns and blood and gore, it just said Messiah. And these were very in your face Christian shirts. And I remember clothes shopping, and uh, I said, Mom, I want to get some of these shirts. And she said, Well, you know, if you get them, you've got to wear it to school. We don't have enough money to be buying these shirts and school shirts. So if this is what you're going to wear in school, you can get them. And I had to make a decision. I'm going to be bold about my faith. And I thank God that he gave me the grace to do so. And so I can see it as a testimony of what it is like for a person who stands in the grace of God. God enables them to stand for Christ in a public school. I remember we would gather every day for prayer at the doors of our school. Some kids from our church and a few other churches, every day we would gather for prayer. And I didn't know it at the time, but obviously God was doing something in our country. Because at the same time, in Texas, kids were gathering for prayer at their schools. And this became a national movement, which we now call See You at the Pole. And I think it started nationally in 1991. And we would all, once a year, we would gather at the flight poles of our schools and pray. But we would do it every day. And I remember we uh, started a Christian club at the high school, and after school we were, were meeting, and, and we, would, uh, we would be weird witnesses. Uh, we would do uh, in-your-face type of things, things that I wouldn't suggest you do or do nowadays. But we were just on fire for Jesus, and maybe did some things in our, our, our zeal that we shouldn't have done. But I remember that we were able to start, as part of the school curriculum, an Old Testament survey class that was taught as, as part of the everyday school curriculum uh, because of our, our faith in Christ. And I just love the fact that God allowed us to do that. Uh, we were able to, to do skits. Uh, they would have um, uh, different you know, school rallies. And we came out and did these in-your-face Christian skits, and we were just bold for Jesus. And I was very thankful that God allowed, allowed that to happen. It was also at that time that I began to be interested in computers and filling around with technology, and God would take that and use that later on in my life. My senior year in high school, I was signed up and accepted to go to the University of Kentucky. I was going to be a wildcat and study at Grandview. I was literally going to Kentucky to study dirt, and I was proud. And there's nothing wrong. It was at that time that God began to deal with me. That he had a call in my life for ministry. And I began to wrestle with that. Was I going to be obedient? What was he calling me to? I felt a really strong call that I was called to be a, a youth pastor. So that last year of high school, I withdrew from the University of Kentucky. I can't tell you dirt about her. I don't know. I didn't learn it. But I went to Southeastern Bible College to study youth ministry. And I think this starts the chapter in my life where I have a whole bunch of, man, I wish I could do that again. Man, I wish I could go back and fix that. But this opens up a season of regret. Even after being a Christian, choices I made and things that I did. So I went to Bible college for two years. Um, kind of inherited the attitude that I already know all this. You know, I... We were part of a good youth group. I know how to do youth ministry. You can't teach me nothing. And so for two years, because you couldn't teach me nothing, I didn't learn nothing. <laughs> and that was my attitude. And so the third year, I uh, began working at a convenience store uh, overnight. So I'd work all night, and go to class during the day, and work all night, class during the day. And as you can imagine, that's not a good pattern to hold. So I began sleeping through my classes, skipping tests, failing most of my classes. 
It was at the same time, that third year, my pastor, who I was uh, spent those middle school years under a very formative pastor in my life, decided he was leaving the church that we were at. I was down in Lakeland at the time. He was here in Butler County. He was leaving this church and going to go work for Teen Challenge over in Bonifay. So our church, my, my, my home church, as I knew it, was changing. My youth pastor, who I was very close with and who I'd spent years being mentored under and was, was uh, like one of his, his kids, was unsure what he was going to do. He was either going to take the church over or he was going to leave and be somewhere else. So he prayed about it and, and he felt called to go to upstate New York to work with the pastor up there. And so I prayed about it and with failing school grades, I thought it was a good time to drop out of school, follow him up to New York to help him start his youth ministry. So I believe it was in January of 1997, I left Florida to move to upstate New York. And it was a culture shock. It was more of a weather shock. I think I've probably seen dusting a few times. We take trips to North Carolina and see a little bit of snow on the floor. But I can remember driving to New York and in the dead of winter, and you hear about this black ice. And what is this black ice? And I would see tar on the road and think, oh my goodness, is that black ice? And uh, so it was kind of a culture shock for this Florida boy to be making a trip to New York. Uh, I remember uh, driving down the interstate and the semi passed me. And I saw this huge sheet of ice fly off the back and <laughs> crash the interstate. And I said, mental note, don't drive behind the semis. Uh, but I was up there in New York and left without a job, without a place to stay, and began working with him, building the youth ministry up there. He was there, I would say, for about two years as a youth pastor, and he felt called to start a church in a city down the road. And so he left to start a church, and I took over his spot as youth pastor, and I served that church for about five or six years as a youth slash associate pastor. The last year I was there, probably around 2004, I really began to struggle with my call to ministry. I had stopped doing youth ministry at that point. I don't know how many of you have worked with teenagers. They're a lot of fun. But I had a group of middle school boys who drove me nuts. They were probably uh, 13, 14 years old, actually like seven or eight, and I just could not handle the immaturity. And it drove me crazy. So I, I backed out of the youth ministry my wife actually took it over, and uh, I began working more as an associate and minister, administrator in the church, and it began to cause a lot of doubt in my life. Was I really called to ministry? And I struggled and struggled and struggled with it. There was a guy at the church, he was a, a deacon, who took a special interest in me. For whatever reason, I'm sure his intentions were good, they did not come across that way. But he was going to teach me about life. And he started taking me places with him, and and telling me things I needed to know and really discouraged me. And it was also at that time that I was, again, so discouraged, I began looking for, for secular jobs out of the ministry there in New York. I was going to just leave and just figure things out. My youth pastor, the one who I had moved and followed up to New York, had, um, as I mentioned, he had gone off and started a church down the road. After that, he came to Florida to work in Teen Challenge. Then he had come back to New York to work in Teen Challenge. And it was at that time he was now back in the state, but not, he was working with the church to try to start a Teen Challenge facility, but not only a part of the church. And then I can remember one specific meeting. We had, a, we had Tuesday prayer meetings where different pastors would gather and we'd pray together. And I remember sitting in, in the pastor's office waiting for everyone to come in. And he came in and just shot me this look of just disgust. And I was like, what's that about? And I remember after the prayer meeting was over, he left my pastor at the time, looked at me, and he said, what was that about? And I thought, good, it wasn't just me who saw that. Something had soured between us, and I don't know what. And somehow, between that thinking that taken interest in me, and, and between him, the details of what happened in all reality, I don't know. And at this point, I don't, don't, don't care. It doesn't matter anymore. But the report that I had gotten was he was behind my back talking about me, trying to get me out of the ministry. My youth pastor, who had raised me for all these years. And so in 2005, uh, I talked to Missy and said, you know what, we just need to start over again. We just need to start. 
All my family was here in Florida, so we packed up, moved back down to Florida. Had no, no church, nowhere we were going, no job, nothing. Just moved back home, didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, took various jobs. I remember I uh, took a landscaping job for one day. Only job I quit after one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I become acclimated to the, the, the northern temperature. I couldn't stand the Florida heat, especially in May. Uh, that was uh, that was not fun. But I eventually found work. Um, while I was in New York working as a pastor, I was also teaching myself how to design websites and design the church's website. Got involved in technology and uh, ended up working here for the city of Bunnell Public Works Department and uh, just anything I could do for work. And we began looking for a church. And we looked all over the place. I think here was actually one of the first churches we landed at when we came back to Florida in 2005. It was a different pastor, obviously, years ago. When we began getting acclimated and getting settled in, I can remember the pastor heard that I had done youth ministry. And he called me at the house and said, Hey, I hear you do youth ministry. Maybe God brought you here to work on staff with us. And I freaked out. I had just gotten out of youth ministry. I had just been in a bad church experience. I was still licking my wounds. I was still feeling very hurt, and it bothered me that this guy who didn't know me at all would reach out to me to come join him on his staff. Because that's, that's not the way I was used to doing things. You get to know somebody first. And I probably overreacted, but we stopped coming to church. And it spent about eight or nine years going from church to church to church to church in the area, trying to find a place that would be home. We'd settle in a place for a while and find something we used to reconcile with and leave and go somewhere else. And it was very difficult for us to find uh, a place to call home. And it was during those years that I still struggled with, with ministry. I remember one of the other deacons at the church when I left said, don't allow yourself to stay out of ministry. He said, I was involved in it, and I left, and I never got back in, and I just I kicked myself for it every day. He says, don't stay out of ministry. You need to get back in. And I wrestled here in Florida with my call. Did God really call me to ministry or did I make it all up? And I remember just the struggle and the anxiety in my heart over whether God really wanted me to do this. And uh, it was at that time that the door opened up in the city of Palm Coast for a job. And it was um, maintaining their website. And my mom encouraged me to apply. I said, there is no way that the city of Palm Coast is going to hire a little old me who thinks around the websites at home to be their web guy. But it was considerable uh, more money than what I was making at the time, so I had to at least try for it. And uh, it was a surprise that I got the job. Uh, they were getting ready to close it because I couldn't get anyone qualified for the job. And I, I only bring that about because I, I've, I've seen in my life how God has used these things to put me on a path that I never would have forged for myself. Amen. How God in high school was was, was putting me in an area where I was interested in technology so that later on down the road I would have a job to provide for my family while I was figuring out what he was doing in my life. And I, I'll never understand, probably, this side of heaven, those years of my life where I spent here in Florida struggling with the call of ministry. What am I supposed to do? And I had people telling me, you should just start a church. I didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. When you've got 4,000 of them in Flagler County, why do we need one more? just because I don't like the other ones that are around, right? Like surely I can find a church here that I can plug into. So, uh, ended up coming back to this church years later. They were in between pastors. Um, I found it to be a very unfriendly church. But I found it wasn't the church so much that was unfriendly, it was me. I came to church and I remember we had uh, the, the pews would fill up and you had a few people up in the balcony and we would come sit right up there on the first balcony, where we were away from most of the people. And when church was over, we'd come down the stairs and right out. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. And I was still, years later, looking at the wounds of what happened to me in church. And it was God that had to show me, these people aren't being unfriendly, it's you. You're not reaching out. You're not opening up. You're not allowing yourself to let these people into your life. And I say that to, to say that maybe you're here. And you think, this is, a, this is not a friendly church. Or some other church you visited is not a friendly church. It very well may be true, but it could also be you. 
It can also be that you are holding yourself back and not allowing others to minister and to love you. So, I came back to this church. Uh, they were image meeting pastors. They got a new pastor. And uh, they had a guy here that was doing youth ministry. And we were coming regularly. My wife was getting involved in things. Uh, she got involved in the kids' ministry. And I was still just kind of hanging out in the outskirts. And uh, the guy that was running the youth ministry at the time was leaving. And this new pastor somehow heard that I had done youth ministry. So he said, would you consider taking over the youth group? Just before this, I had been wrestling with God. Really feel the burden to come back to the ministry. Just an overwhelming burden that God, I'm wasting my life. Before this, we had gone to the church in St. Augustine. They also had a children pastor. Must be the thing we do in Florida, is have children pastors. But this pastor came and visited me at my house, and I told him about my struggle for ministry. He had given me this book um, by John Piper, Don't Waste Your Life. And I can remember the profound impact this book had on my life. And I was struggling, and what do I do with this burden I feel, this call I feel to minister? And so at the time, it was I was working at Palm Coast. I had done some side work in technology. And uh, our, our family was struggling financially. And I knew I needed to make a decision. I needed to either double down and do more side work, get more invested in my business, um, doing websites on the side to bring more income in, or I had to put it off and to go into ministry. But I had no prospects for ministry, and I had two solid prospects coming for businesses. But at this time, the church came to me and the pastor said, would you mind being the youth leader? And those two prospects I had fell away. So I said, okay, God, I hear you. Even though I had stepped away from youth ministry and didn't know if I wanted to deal with teenagers who were 14 years old, acting like eight-year-olds, I said, God, I hear you. So I stepped in here. And I can tell you what an amazing experience it was being a youth group in this church. And the young people I got to work with. It was just, uh, it was just so much joy in my heart. And so that kind of brought me to where I am today. That pastor left. Another interim pastor came in, and he stayed. So hey. The first interim pastor actually stayed. So that was my testimony and my call to ministry. Romans chapter 8 says, God causes all things to work for good. And those that love him, they are called according to his purpose. I can never tell you as I was walking through it why God put those things in my life. Why did God put a, 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 a knowledge for technology and a, a desire to work with it? Why was that there? I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you why God allowed me to go through the pain I went through at that church or why God allowed me to, to live outside of the ministry for so long and struggle with that calling. But when I look back, I realize God calls all those little things for my benefit, for my good, in my life. So, Luke chapter 7. I do not like these verses. I told you I was a church kid, raised in church. I guess you could say I had the typical uh, uh, white American middle class life. Never did anything bad. Never been drunk a day in my life. Kept myself from marriage. All the things good Christian kids did. And I read these verses and I didn't like them. Because Jesus said in verse 41, he tells the parables to Simon, he was a Pharisee. He says, A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Denarii was like a day's wage. So the one that owed 50, it was like he was about two months in debt to this person. The other one was just Almost two years of death. One of 500 and the other 50. When they could not pay, he called, uh, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one I suppose for whom he canceled a larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. In this story, Simon is a Pharisee. Uh, he's one of the ones we heard Audrey read about earlier who, who they knew the law, but they didn't know God. They had all the knowledge, they had all the religion right, 
that they had no relationship with God. And so Simon was one, he's trying to figure out who is this Jesus I'm hearing about. They hear about this prophet that's coming through. Who is he really? And he invites them to dinner to try to figure out who Jesus is. And while they're at dinner, they're around this lower table and they're reclining, either, either laying on his stomach or laying on his arm, eating at the meal, and his legs are behind him. And while they're there at this Pharisee's house, this very proper religious man, this prostitute comes in. This dirty woman comes in and begins to weep and cry all over Jesus' feet and wash his feet with her hair. And then he has this expensive ointment and begins to just uh, pour it all over his feet. And Simon says to himself, if Jesus knew who this woman was, if he were really a prophet, he would not allow this filthy, dirty woman to touch him, this unclean woman to touch him. See, Simon thought that Jesus couldn't see the woman's heart. But Jesus was about to show him, oh, I can see your heart, and I can see yours too. And yours is the one that gets a little bit of work. But he tells the story of this woman who is obviously the one who owed 500 days wages in debt, and Simon who owed 50. And he said, when, when, when the debtor cancels the, the debt of them both, the one that owed 500 loves them more. And I thought, God, what about me? I'm in the 50 category. I haven't done these awful things. I've never murdered anyone. I haven't slept with anyone. I've never been drunk. I've never beaten anybody up. I don't curse. I don't swear. I'm a good kid. How do they get to love you more? That didn't seem fair. That didn't seem right. Because I loved him. And I wanted my love to grow. And as Christians, we want our love for Jesus to grow. And, and so people will justify, well, if I sin more, then I can love him more. But those are the people that don't want to love him in the first place. They're just looking for a reason to sin. Because I knew that wasn't an option for me. I couldn't sin more because I loved him. But I wanted to love him more based on those that sin more or love him more. So I didn't like these verses very much. I didn't understand why I couldn't love Jesus the same way those that were broken loved Jesus. Because I wanted to. It took me a while to grow. To realize that before God rescued me, I was on the path of being a Simon. I was on the path of being a Pharisee. I was on the path of being one very well religiously educated who was better than anybody else and looked down at everybody else. And though maybe I had technically 50 debt of sins to my name, I was wicked and dead on the inside. It wasn't until I realized the wickedness of my own heart that even though others may have committed more sins than me, I didn't know the depth of my own sin. And once I understood how unrighteous and how dirty and how selfish I am as a church kid, then I recognized the wonderful amount of what Christ did for me. Do you think that Jesus died for you less than he died for others? Do you think that because you were raised in church and you were good most of your life, that when Jesus was flogged and when he was whipped, that covered the penalty of your sin? But for, for the homosexuals and the adulterers and the murderers, he had to go the full distance. He had to die on the cross for them. But for you, it was enough that he was whipped a little bit. Do you need less of the blood of Jesus to cleanse you than those that we think are vile and wicked and evil. I tell you, if you think that's the case, you probably don't know your own heart too well. You need to look inside and realize that the sin we carry inside of ourselves, when we look at Adam and Eve, they rebelled once. It took one bite, and they were expelled from the garden, destined for eternity in hell, and Jesus had to come and pay the price for them. So when I realized the vastness of my sin, I realized how much I could love Jesus. And then I realized there's other reasons to love Jesus also. It's not just because that he freed me from my sins, but I could also love him because he kept me from my sins. Because others may have had experienced horrible things, but God kept me from those things for whatever reason he saw fit. And so I loved him all the more for that. 
So I want to ask you this morning. We didn't go through this whole story, but who are you in this story? Are you the woman who sinned a lot? You realize that she was at home. She was in her house. And when she heard where Jesus was, when she found out he was at the Pharisee's house, she found the most expensive thing she could, and she had to go see him. What would you do if you heard Jesus was here in Flagler County at a dignitary's house? And you knew you had to, you had to break in and disturb the, the atmosphere in order to get a, a chance to see him. Would you find the most expensive thing you had and break into the house and cause a disturbance and make it awkward just in order to thank him for what he did for you? Are you that one this morning? Or are you me? Are you the Pharisee? Are you on the path that I was on, raised in church all these years? Maybe you're the music leader Audrey talked about. Raised in church, leading ministries, but you yourself are dead inside, dead in your own sin. It doesn't matter how many ministries you lead. It doesn't matter how many church services you go to. It doesn't matter what you do for God if you're dead on the inside. And I'm telling you, God is here this morning to make dead things alive. If you're here and you've been in this church for 20, 30 years, you've been in a church for 20, 30 years, don't think that you're okay if you're not born again. And don't leave this place without making your relationship with God right. Because God is here, and he's not only calling wicked, evil sinners that we look at and say they're, they're, they're awful. He's calling them church kids, too. He's calling them good kids, too. And he wants to make you. So as we close, I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come. You know, I don't remember what it was. Specifically, the journey to Christ. I remember, like my wife, she shared last week, it was Peter. I was scared of him now. I was afraid of what everlasting judgment would be. It was fear that drew me to God. But I can tell you, after all these years, it's not fear that keeps me. I love him. I'm so thankful for him. And I don't want that love inside of me to grow cold. And I'm telling you, if you've never experienced that love, you sat in church and you've heard it for years and years and years, but that love has never touched your heart. It's one thing to live out there and be on the streets and be in, in the gutters and, and to be a drug addict and never, never hear the gospel and die, but to sit under the preaching of the word and to never experience the love of God for yourself is a tragedy. And I'm telling you, God is calling you this morning. You may go home and wrestle like I did, but don't wrestle for long. Repent and believe the gospel. Would you stand and join me? Jesus, as we come before you, God, I ask you, as we sang before, does your spirit move among us? And he does. I ask that your spirit would move among us this morning. God, that those that are dead in their sins, God, that you would give them eyes to see their deadness. God, that you would convict them. God, as pastor often prays, if they leave this place without starting their relationship with you, don't let them sleep at night. Let your convicting power rest upon them. God, I pray the way you wrestled with Jacob, you would wrestle with them. God, don't let them go. God, I pray maybe for those who, whose love has grown cold this morning, rekindle the fire, God, I pray. Draw them to you in a new and a fresh way. God, I pray this, this morning you would do a new work in our church. Turn our hearts to you. Don't let us look to things or to programs or our busyness or our activities. God, give us a yearning and a longing to see you move again in our church and in our county. Do a work this morning.